This is Dan McCarty, four-time Stanley Cup champion, Detroit Red Wings, Lemieux, killer, Stanley Cup winning goal guy. Uh, you're listening to SportsRadioDetroit.com. Fucking around. Oh, Jesus. Fucking around. I am Jason Pinkham with the franchise Steve Hyde. We're both here on SportsRadioDetroit.com. Oh, the playoffs are fun. How you doing, Steve? I'm doing great, man. How are you? I am great. Today is a perfectly temperatured day. It's like 64 out. My personal life is in complete disarray as per usual. And there's a crap ton of hockey to watch. So I'm in a great mood. Uh <laughs> Where do we start? Because we could start, you know... We could start with the obvious, you know, do a series by series recap as we probably normally would. Uh, but I think we're going to get to that anyways. I want to start with what is coming clearly the headline story. You literally, if you are any in any way interested in hockey at all, uh, you definitely know what happened uh, two nights ago now uh, as of recording Wednesday, May 3rd. So May 1st it happened. Uh, Sidney Crosby was going in for what looked like, a, you know, pretty decent shot on net a pretty decent uh pseudo breakaway uh when he was slashed from behind by alex ovechkin tripped over Braden holtby and slid into face first unfortunately into uh matt niskanen's stick and he suffered a concussion uh he will not be playing tonight uh but you know that's all obvious you know that if you know hockey if you're listening to us you already definitely knew that you've already heard tons of coverage on that We're going to talk about this from the angle of, you know, Steve having had several concussions. I myself never had any, but I'm going to talk about it from the Niskanen perspective. So we're going to offer two different perspectives on this play just, you know, as players, because I'm a defenseman and and Steve has suffered a concussion. Let's start with Steve's side of this. You know, what 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 is what is it like to suffer a concussion? And then one step further, what is it like? In terms of the next day, the day after that, you know, is this the kind of thing that, you know, we talked about a pre-show, he's had four of them, you know, is this the kind of thing that we could, you could maybe see, foresee him being out for the series, the rest of the postseason, uh, I mean, could he be back tomorrow, you know, Friday night, what, what are you thinking on this? I think it all depends on mainly his recovering process, I mean, the first time he had one, he was out, what, almost a year or so? Like when he had the major, major one, it was a while. And I know the NHL is really strict on their protocol now. It's changed a lot in the last few years to really protect players from having long-term harboring problems because of the concussions. The concussion protocol is really serious nowadays. It even stems down to the minor league levels now, which is like like 10 and 12-year-olds when things like this happen. It's the same proto- protocols. Quiet room. You got to figure everything out. As far as like how it feels, it's essentially like having a mad hangover and everything is kind of foggy. Like, that's how it felt. You have, like, this heartbreaking headache, and everything feels like you're in a daze. Like, you feel groggy, you feel sleepy, it's awful. And then your reaction time is just garbage. Like, things can happen, and you're just like, like, two seconds later, you're like, oh, okay. It's, it's, it really takes a hampering on your motoring skills, for sure. It's, it's just not fun. And on top of that, you know, there's, everybody deals with different symptoms differently. So, like, I had a lot of nausea, because... I can't deal with headaches very well. It's just not a forte of mine. I just wasn't built for that. <laughs> so well, I had a really bad headache and then I had nausea and then like trying to do any kind of rapid movement like skating, it can be kind of tough the first few times you do it. But after a while, most of the time the symptoms can kind of go down and you, you kind of work through it. it t- like my one, I was out for like a month and a half. So it wasn't too bad. That's a long time though. I mean, that's that's nothing to scoff at. I mean, a month and a half is not short. Now, this this all stems. I mean, our discussion on it. We like like we, we talked about this in the pre-show, and you know, the listeners know we tend to we tend to normally shy away from topics that are this covered. You know, this is not we're not we're supposed to be a talk a sports talk alternative. But you know, a, a, a section a side of this story that's not getting talked about, and 
you know, maybe it's because, you know, to the to some people this is I guess, you know, this is common knowledge. To me, this is not common knowledge. To me, this was uh, new information, you know, to read an article. I read the article on TSN uh, .ca. A neurosurgeon says if Crosby were an amateur, he'd be advised to quit hockey. Uh, the director of Canadian Concussion Center at Toronto Western Hospital says when it comes to the number of acknowledged concussions, you can usually double the total for athletes to participate in collision sports. So from that, you know, paragraph alone, I mean, you're looking at a guy who, you know, it's four published concussions, which means just on that alone, you're looking at probably seven, eight, maybe nine, you know, and then to take it a step further, neurosurgeon Charles Tater says when someone has suffered multiple concussions, the chance of having persistence, persisting symptoms goes up ter- terrifically. He notes that athletes may experience the sensation of seeing stars or might take knocks to the head at the youth level, but don't acknowledge them as head injuries. And I'm going to finish the article. Very much quick. so. Yeah, I'll finish it up and then we can go from there. Tater says a concern for Crosby is to consider at this point is the likelihood of a full recovery. I'm sorry, a concern for Crosby to consider at this point is the likelihood of a full recovery since the chances of that go down as the number of concussions goes up. He also says that the fact that Crosby needed almost a year to recover from a concussion in early 2011 means there was a significant residual effect on his brain. Tater adds that if Crosby were an amateur, he would probably advise, be advised to quit the sport. Now, your reaction to this when I told you about this, and, and this is where I, I think our discussion will come from, was that that was sort of common knowledge. And the question I'll ask you is, do you believe that that is common knowledge maybe because you're so immersed in the sport and you have experience with having concussions? Or is this just something that you've you know, run across with your circles of friends? Um, I think it's a mixture of both, but mainly the first one just because, you know, any kind of sport that you play, you want to know the inherent risks and injuries. You know, your most common injuries for most hockey players, I would say the biggest one is probably a concussion. I mean, you might get a cut or two from a stick or a loose puck, maybe a broken bone if you, you know, go into the boards or, or block a shot a certain way. But most of the time, concussion is the biggest one, especially because of how the nature of the sport is literally physical. And at a lot of lower levels, too, like kid levels, you see – Games get out of hand really quickly because you have, you know, amateur referees. You don't they don't control the games. Things can get out of hand. And that's where you have a lot of these, you know, diagnosed, undiagnosed concussions happening. Kid takes a spell on the boards. He gets up. He kind of feels foggy, maybe a little sick. He doesn't think it's a concussion. There it is. There's one, you know, like things like that kind of happen. And uh, like with the last 10 years, I think. You know, Eric Lindros is probably one of the biggest things with this whole scenario. Like, he basically couldn't play hockey effectively because of how many times his brain got rattled. Like, that that's a thing. And then, you know, having that huge thing with Crosby in 2011 really made the NHL kind of go back and see, we need to really figure this out and put a forefront on it. And, I mean, the helmet technology has changed drastically in the last five or six years, too, to accommodate a lot of this stuff, too. Well, okay, so, you know... I understand that, and and I guess for me it just seemed uh, maybe it's because a lot of my experience lately has been with the NFL, and some of that has to do with the fact that the NFL doesn't really like talking about it. They just like saying he went to the dark room and he's going to be out for X amount of time. They don't really acknowledge it, and then you go to the NHL, and I mean it's as far as the NHL is concerned, this is an NFL problem. Like they do not acknowledge this as a problem that they have, and you know we're looking at a situation where a guy like Sidney Crosby, you know. I mean that that's that's a guy who is incredibly important to our sport on I mean every level possible. He not only does he make teams better in terms of, you know, nobody gives Pittsburgh any credit because who the hell is Connor Sheary and who the fuck are all these players and he just makes them better along him and Malkin. But he's also a phenomenal ambassador for the sport. He's he's very popular and a lot of people, you know, He's well liked outside of Detroit because our fans don't let go of anything, but he's well liked uh, outside of Pittsburgh because, I mean, he's affable. He's grown into the role of being a leader, and and he handles it well. And to see, we're looking at the possibility of him, you know, being gone for, you know, maybe maybe it is just one game or two games. Maybe he comes back and he's fine. But there is the possibility that he's done for the playoffs. There's also the possibility that you know, one more of these and we don't get Sidney Crosby anymore. And that's that's not something that I want to think about and and it it begs to mind, you know, the question comes and, you know, we're still going to get into the Niskanen side of this discussion, but but we're going to finish this side first. The question that comes to my mind is, you know, is there, I mean, this is Sidney fucking Crosby. He's one of the most protected players in the game. Is there literally nothing we can do to prevent this? I think the moment you put in the instigator rule, 
this is why this happens. I'm a firm believer of that. Just because of the fact that you can't defend yourself anymore. You get thrown out of a game for it. <laughs> I mean, like the hit was it didn't the hit didn't look as bad as it was, but it just like if you can't take Sidney Crosby from getting literally two handed chopped in the back of the neck by the other best player in the world, and then you get a stick in the face, a concussion, I mean, there's really not much else you can do. I mean, I, I have a feeling tonight's game though is gonna be a little bit more physical than normal. <laughs> Oh wow! What a surprise. I heard. I heard there's. I heard there was rumblings they're going to put uh, Tim Cicito in the lineup. So we'll see what happens with that. Steve, that's some uh, good analysis on your part there. <laughs> hey man, take. I scoured Twitter. I'm just ready for it. Hot fucking take here on Bucking Around. After their captain is taken out, Pittsburgh might get tough. <laughs> yeah, they did the rest of that game, dude. They, they played did. some that pissed game, off hockey. That game was. Furious. That game was Bill like, Kessel was even throwing some limber around, and I'm just like, he's going to be out of shape halfway through this period. Keeps up like that. <laughs> Bill Kessel was just like, <sighs> <sighs> chop. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so you know, jumping further into this, let's let's talk about the other side of this 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 event, if you will, because Matt Niskanen is being fucking vilified. Matt Niskanen is being uh, hailed as the enemy of enemies in Pittsburgh, as the tweet I sent you, Rob Rossi, uh, even going so far as to Rob Rossi, who, from what I understand, is like the uh, oh, the name is escaping me, Jeff something in Detroit. Uh, he's, Rieger? No, not Rieger. He's an outsider guy. He's not. He's not in uh-huh. with anybody. Jeff Ross, the Jeff uh-huh. Ross, the Jeff Ross of, and it's fitting his last name is Rossi. The Jeff Ross of Pittsburgh, he's sort of an outsider. If you recall, uh, I believe it was last year, Jeff Ross around this time or maybe March of last year accused Detroit of having an in-locker room Swedish mafia. Uh, Rob Rossi taking it a step further and saying that the entire play was a coordinated conspiratorial effort by the Washington Capitals and Barry Trotz to take out Sidney Crosby out of the series, which is fucking retarded. That it, I mean, it, it is just plain fucking stupid. Like, you're not going to get me to back off on this. If you watch that play, and where I'm saying we need to come in on the Niskan inside of this, and we could talk, touch on Rossi too, it, if you look at the way Niskanen is positioned when Crosby slams face first into his chick, into his stick, Niskanen is setting up for, yes, it, admittedly a cross check to his chest. And then, in the span of maybe two-thirds of a second... Crosby goes from upright to down at a 30-degree angle and face first with his stick. And then Niskanen, you can, if you watch his right hand, it slides towards his left hand, which is he's trying to prevent a fall at that point. He is now in a situation where he is trying to just – he's defensive. It's a defensive position. He's, he's trying to – he's no longer trying to decimate Crosby. He's now like, ah, shit, this is not going to end well for me if I keep going in this position. So it is my belief that even if there was intent to cross-check Crosby, there was not intent to concuss Crosby. And there certainly was not a fucking locker room conspiracy created by Barry Trotz to take out Sidney Crosby. Do you see it differently? You were kind of shaking your head there. I, I agree with the whole conspiracy thing. That's just, that's just stupid. We're going to get that out of the way real quick. There's no conspiracy. But opportunity presented itself. It happened. I mean, the whole the the whole series of Niskanen and Crosby have been going at it. Uh, Niskanen slashed Crosby a bunch of times. Crosby kind of gave him some jazz back. You know, this is hockey at this point. But that opportunity presented itself. He was coming across from the corner. He took four strides before he hit Crosby. Like he won. He was gonna hit Crosby regardless of whatever happened. If that puck went in the net, Niskanen was finishing his check. I don't care what anybody says. I could tell that's a hot. I could tell at the point of like where he was coming from, that he had intent to hit Crosby. There was no ifs, ands, or buts. Yeah, he kind of fumbled and slid, but you could tell he was going to cross-check him no matter what. And that's where I disagree with you. Like, there is no incidental cross-checking. He was going to cross-check him. That's just, that's what it was going to happen. And the fact he hit him in the head doesn't bode well for him at all. That's, a, that's why he got a five. And I'm glad that the NHL decided not to give him any more than that. Because I thought the five in a game misconduct in a playoff game is good enough for that kind of a hit. I'm okay with that. I'm I'm of the belief that you know, and 
say what you will about it. I'm of the belief that I'm not saying Matt Niskanen is an innocent little baby. I'm saying Matt Niskanen was going for a vicious cross check and ended up viciously cross checking his face. Like I'm saying that Matt Niskanen. There's no difference there. You're still committing a cross check, which is a penalty. Yeah, and then on top of it, you had head contact. Right. No, no, no. Probably put this guy out for four to five months, maybe. Yeah, but it is different in the sense that the NHL has always or has been in recent years, as you know, dating back to like 2009 ish, maybe a little bit before. They've been they've decided that they want to. they want to penalize intent, as you as you pointed out, the instigator penalty. Uh, so, if you want to penalize intent, you you have to look at that from the, the perspective of he was going for a cross check, which a cross check, which is, is a penalty, two minute minor. And then if you, not necessarily, you can have a cross checking major if you hurt somebody. That's that's it. That's the how that rule changes. If you commit an injury on a cross check, you can be you can have a five minute major game misconduct. That is an add on to that penalty. That well, is a rule. I don't know. It just it. I don't think he deserves to be vilified for for what he did. I, I just I think that what he was he's doing, gonna be. It's Sidney freaking Crosby, and then on top of that, like the whole series, he was in Crosby's face. You know, slashing, doing that, that's his job is to take – he plays the most minutes against the best player in the world. You're going to be vilified if you hurt that player, regardless of intent, regardless of what – you know, he even said it. He's like, yeah, I feel bad that it happened, but nothing I'm going to say to the guy is going to make him feel better. He's got a concussion. Like, he realizes what happened, but, you know, Nat, Matt Niskanen is not known as a dirty player, but Matt Niskanen and Sidney Crosby have a past. That is a thing. I've researched that over the last few days. That is a very known thing. Fine. You win. He was trying to kill him. He was trying to murder. I'm not, him. I'm not saying he's trying to kill him, but if you have an opportunity to take the best player out of the game, you're going to do it. That's hockey. Yeah. That's what happens when you play a physical sport. They do this shit in football. I mean, how many conspiracies are there that there's literally like running like contracts for hurting people in games? Like it's not it's not any different in the NHL. Their coach is like, if you get a chance to take him out, take him out, hit him. Hit him hard. How many hits do we? How many times do we see certain forwards hit certain defensemen? No matter what the situation. Like Ryan Kessler does this shit all the time. Like this is not anything different. Speaking of certain defensemen, I'm gonna <laughs> segue nicely for your uh, suggested topic. Mike Milbury decided. Is it Mike Milbury? I know it's mm-hmm. Milbury. Okay, I fucking hate that guy. So I don't really commit any of his information to my brain. Mike Milbury decided to have his Milbury minute on. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little, uh, little defenseman by the name of P.K. Subban. A uh, little uh, African-American defenseman by the name of P.K. Subban, who was, quote-unquote, acting like a clown when he was doing his pregame dancing ritual, which is something that he does every game, regardless of the context. This is something that he's been doing for a long time. I don't know why it's now an issue. The question I'll ask you is, do you feel I mean, I, we're kind of going to old school spinning around here? I'm sorry, or spinning the wheels here with like question and answer. I don't mean to, but I mean this is kind of question and answer format because this is like this shit's all kind of dumb. Like, why is he doing this? Like, what's the point? Like, why bring it up? Why is he just? Is it just that he's that inept at actually analyzing a game that he has to go with like the obvious thing that's going to get him headlines, or is it just that he's that dumb that he doesn't realize that that's the obvious thing that's going to get him headlines? It's probably both, but I mean, dumb is still the forefront of that answer. <laughs> if we're being, I've never liked Mike Milbury. He, no one he, He's always he's always the guy that says the controversial, stupid shit in those pregame segments, and you're just like, well, like, why does this guy have a job? But then it's like you tune in to see what he says that's stupid, and then you, you have all these fans that get rage about it, and then it gets some views, it gets some numbers, which, and then you think about it, he's he's on the he's on a team with Jeremy Roenick. And Jeremy Roenick doesn't even say some of this shit. It's just like, what's happening? I, I think that they know that they're getting – I mean, it's kind of hard to say because they're the only American source of the NHL playoffs, so their numbers are probably pretty good anyway. But eh, I don't know not. I don't know what his problem is with P.K. Subban. He's always had this inkling, even when they traded him. Yeah, I think it was a great trade to get rid of P.K. Subban. Like, what are you, fucking stupid? <laughs> like this guy's up. This guy is out here six and or seven and one in the playoffs. You know how, what Shea Weber is? He's not in the playoffs. <laughs> two and four. He's not in the playoffs. <laughs> they have four. one loss in eight regulation playoff games. One. Yeah. They're about to go to the Western Conference final 
who predicted that? Yeah. No, but it's true. Don't dance in warm ups, man. You might trigger some people. Honestly, good, I think. Oh, good lord. I think it might be just. I mean, it, it might not be like latent racism. Like, it's not like he's like, I hate all the darkies, but it might be a situation where it's like. It he, is. No, 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 but it might be a situation where he doesn't know. Like, you ever had that person who doesn't know why they're uncomfortable around black people? Like, I'm sure you've yeah. met a person like that, like, mm-hmm. who just, they don't get it. They don't get that that's why they're uncomfortable around black people. So they just sort of make, like, well, like, you'll, you'll meet it. Like, I, I, a great, great example from my own personal life. Very recently, like two weeks ago, there's this guy, you know, lives, lives a couple houses away from me. Seems like a normal guy. He's never spoken out against black people. When black people come over to our our house, he hangs out with them no problem. But then he'll make like some offhand. He made an offhanded comment, and he was like, "Well, I used to live, you know, a couple miles north of here, but then that neighborhood got too black." Like, oh boy, he doesn't. Like, <laughs> You're just it, like, well, can't be friends with that guy anymore, right? And, and it, for me, it was like, okay, well, I'm not gonna, you know, associate with this guy too much anymore. But also, I was able to. Like I put things, I put racism into a couple categories, you know, and this is in like the shoebox of like ignorance more than like maliciousness. Hatred. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. It's not like you know he, you're not going to see him at any rallies, and he's certainly going to like, like he certainly doesn't support Trump. You know what I mean? Like they're yeah. not, they're not like they won't, they won't support legislation against people, but they just don't like being around them. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that that's okay. It's certainly fucking awful, but. With that being said, this is the kind of what I think it is when I say the Milbury racism, where it's like he doesn't know why he doesn't like P.K. Subban, but he really doesn't like P.K. Subban. And it's documented, as you pointed out. I think a lot of it, too, is like this is whole no no fun allowed in professional hockey. Like you can't celebrate. He's like that old school mentality that I just despise. And that's one of the reasons why I love Alexander Ovechkin. I love, you know, Kuznetsov with his you know, flapping wings when he sallies, when he when he scores goals. Like, I love that kind of stuff because it's like it makes the game fun. It makes me want to watch. What I don't want to watch is stale robots. Like that's that's not what I want to watch. People just naturally, you know, they have things that trigger them that make them happy or fun. Like you're playing the game of hockey professionally. I'd be having a ball out there, dude. Like, dude, I could be getting Steve Ott minutes and, and money and I would be having a f- freaking ball out there because i'd just be like i love this i'm being able to do what i love for a living and it's like you can clearly see pk suban has a like a really good just handle on what he's doing right now in nashville and it's like rejuvenating his career he's having fun he's playing on a great hockey team right now and you can see that clearly in his mind and just answering all these interviews and these questions about the stuff. He's just like, it's whatever, dude, I'm having a good time. We're the, we're Stanley cup playoffs. We're three, one lead. Next question. Like he's, he's tuned in. He knows what's going on. No, he absolutely. He like, he gets it on, on the level that we want. We like, we here at this show and, and I'm sure all the other podcasters who do this for free, they want that sort of mentality from their players where it's like, guys, um, don't know if you know this whole thing or not, but, uh, I'm playing a fucking game. <laughs> yeah. Like they're paying me ten million dollars a year to play a game, so I'm gonna have fun. Like that's I'm okay with that. I'm on board with it a hundred percent. And you know, I, I think that, that kind of goes without saying. But I think that you know, if if you want to understand Millbury, you have to you know spend some time at like a Moose Lodge or a Hibernian oh. Hall <laughs> or you know Friends of the Eagles, like people that are like. You know, you go into a room and like it's one hundred percent white. You know what I mean? Like they yep. don't they don't know why they don't like black people, but they don't like black people and they don't know why. Like it's they just they want. It's hard to understand to put it in terms of like I'm trying to like I'm speaking in an upbeat tune about racism. Like don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this is okay. None of this is okay. But if I had to select a flavor of racist to exist in this world, that's the flavor I would want. One we can bitch about, but we don't have to worry about. You know what I mean? Yeah, it makes sense. Like, we're not getting a fucking Timothy McVeigh out of these people. Like, that's really all I'm really concerned about is, like, just don't vote that way and don't kill people for that reason. And we're cool. But, anyways, I digress. I mean, we're not going to solve racism on pucking around. Uh, let's jump into the easiest topic ever to talk about: the list of players who are draft exempt. 
Also, the li- also known as the list of players who don't play hockey anymore, but for some reason are still getting paid to play hockey. <laughs> Chris Pronger. <laughs> they, I'm just going to hit the list real quick. And you know, Do dear it. listener, dear listener, st- pause the podcast in case you know any of these players. Yeah, or, let me replace that. Pause the podcast if any of these players are relevant. Players include forwards David Bullen and Craig Hun- Cunningham and defensive Chris Pronger of the Arizona Coyotes, Buffalo Sabres forward Cody McCormick, winger David Clarkson of the Columbus Blue Jackets, winger Johan Franzen and center Joe Vitale of the Detroit Red Wings, New Jersey Devils r- winger Ryan Klo, New York Islanders center Mikhail Grabowski, Pascal Dupuis of the Pittsburgh Penguins, and winger Nathan Horton and blue liner Stéphane Robida of the Toronto Maple Leafs. You're a Maple Leafs fan. Who the fuck are those guys in terms of on-ice talent? Well, I know Ryan Horton was a pretty big force on the Nathan Boston Horton. Bruins for a while. Nathan Horton, I'm sorry, was a You're pretty okay. pretty big uh, force there for the uh, the Bruins for a minute there. And then he kind of got hurt, and that that was it. Yeah, Same thing with done. Clarkson. <laughs> he yeah. just got buried. Clarkson, I think, is on the Blue Jackets, and he think he he had a comeback this year. Like I think he did for a little year. bit, yeah. But I mean, the, none of these guys are relevant. I, like this is the this is the problem. This is the problem I have with the NHL is that you know even when we get news before our show. It is. It's like a. It's like a troll almost. It, it is. They're like, "Hey guys, here's the exemplus," and you're like, oh, "Holy fuck!" Like when I clicked that link, I was like, "Oh my god, this is gonna be the team exemplus." Like I was ready to fucking die. I was like, "No, he did not just Rip. give me the list." And then I click it, and it's like, "Oh, so, so Chris Pronger can't be drafted, huh?" Okay. Um. Thank. Thanks, NHL, for that. Uh. That bit of information, I'm really, uh, really glad you provided me with that useful insight into the goings on of your league. Go ahead. It's Steve. almost like those Facebook posts that you see, like it's like a like, oh, this looks really interesting. You click it, it's like those inside Facebook made website that's like not a legitimate source talking about some news, and you're just like, oh, okay then, and you click off of it. You get really disappointed because you think it's going to be something really good, and then it's just like, I could have told you that. It is 100 percent <laughs> clickbait. Like they put it in the phrase of a designated list of exempt players, and you're like, yeah, I thought it was the actual list that yeah. they were saying that they were going to release for I, all the teams. I swear to God, I almost shit my pants at work. I'm not even kidding. Like when I read that, I was like, oh, they're posting it early. Like I get a whole month to talk about this. I'm so happy. Nope, nope. They're just posting a list of guys who are either 40 or older, or you know, physically 40 or older not ever going to play in the NHL again, or if they are going to play in the NHL again, they're not going to be relevant in the NHL again. You're not going to see a Pascal Dupuis comeback. You're not going to see a fucking David Clarkson renaissance. You're not going to see any of this. It's just a bunch of dudes who no one cares about. I don't know why they posted it. I don't know why they they tricked us into clicking on it, other than to trick us into clicking on it. That's what I think it is. Speaking of tricking us into watching it, Ottawa, New York is a (laughs) series that segue and a half Anyways, it's a series that has been unexpectedly good. Uh, Ottawa leading because the NHL loves to fucking prove me wrong. Uh, Ottawa leading currently 2-1. to one. I believe they will be playing tomorrow night on Thursday, May 4th. This is a series that is not going in a way that I expected. You're seeing 6-5 to five double overtime games. Then you, the next night you're seeing 3-1s, to 4-1s. to ones. Like It's kind of swinging back and forth based on, you know, who's home and who has the momentum. I mean... Are you uh, are you as impressed as I have been with this series, Steve? I've been a little bit more so the fact that New York has had chances where they've legitimately just choked leads, and I'm just like, why? Why you do this? Why you do this to me? Because it's like they're playing, they play really, really out of their mind well, and then all of a sudden Ottawa comes back, wins in overtime. You're just like, what happened? Like, where did this go wrong? How did you score six you. goals on Henrik Lundqvist? I am having an aneurysm right now. I wish I could tell you because I, I think I think the reason is, and I, I'm going to be. Uh, just, just forthright with you here. This is a kind of an intervention. I, I don't know if you, you know, um, the NHL likes doing the opposite of what people who watch it for decades think will happen. So that you, explains my playoff bracket exactly. So you you watched a team like the New York Rangers, who've been excellent all year, playing a team going into a series against a team like Ottawa, who's been mediocre all year, and you're like, well, that's going to be easy. New York should win that in five, maybe six at the most. And then Ottawa <laughs> wins six to five in double overtime, and you're like, "Well, what the fuck?" It, 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 
I watched the four to one game last night, which was somewhat of a drubbing by New York. New York was, you know, getting their swing back punch. Like, you know, hey, we're still New York. Like, Lundqvist was like, I'm still not going to let you score. And New York's like, we're still going to score all the time. And uh, Michael Grabner was still like, hey, you could have had me instead of Darren Helm. And I was like, yeah, yeah, we could have. But <laughs> actually, fun fact that made me look up, uh, <clears throat> made me look up uh, career playoff numbers. This postseason, Michael Grabner has four pl- postseason goals. For his entire career, Darren Helm has 11. Hmm. Just to put that in perspective, in nine games, <laughs> in nine games, Michael Grabner has seven less goals than Darren Helm has in 50. Yikes. Yeah. 50, maybe 55. <laughs> yeah. That's just, just something to think about for the Detroit fans who listen to this show. Could have had him for a third of the cost. Anyways, uh, yeah, Michael Grabner getting a nice little play into Craig Anderson's weakness of accidentally coming out too far, getting a nice little wraparound goal. Zabanajad everywhere, and then uh, who's his linemate whose name is escaping me? Uh, who plays in his line? Messi? No, it's another longer name. Yeah, you can't he, remember. He had the first goal last night. Yeah. Uh, Zuccarello? Zuccarello, yes. Matt Zuccarello has been... Was everywhere last night. I mean, Zuccarello. I that first period, there was maybe what felt like two minutes of it where they weren't talking about how great Zuccarello was doing in that period. <laughs> He's like the poor man's Martin St. Louis, to be honest with you. Just he kind of plays the same. I thought Martin St. Louis was the poor man's Yarmir Yager. Well, then he's the poor man Yarmir Yager times two. I I got nothing <laughs> so on he's that. He's the double poor man Yarmir Yager. <laughs> the double poor man. The welfare poor man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, Zuccarello, this team, I don't even know what to say because, like, they they, they don't – I don't mean to speak for you in this one, Steve, but we, but we both know that they suck defensively. Like, we both know that this road possibly has an end in the next round because if Pittsburgh survives, if Crosby comes back, they're a force to be reckoned with. And Washington and New York, I just don't have any faith in New York in that series. Like – I don't have any faith in either of these teams coming out of this. I, I, I mean, you do, so maybe you could speak to that. What? Do you, what do I just you think a lot of it comes – like what you're kind of alluding to, a lot of it comes to the defense because that's the one thing that's caught me off guard in this series. That I knew in the first round they played, a, they played a much better offensive team and played better defensively than they are playing now against a weaker offensively team, <laughs> which is like mind-numbingly dumb to me. I'm just like – I'm hitting my head watching these games like how, what, how? But then I remember that Brendan Smith – you know they have Foss back there. They have a lot of rookie defensemen in the in the New York core. They you know they have two really good guys, and they got Marstall. But like they're susceptible to any team that can literally like play physical. And I think that's the one thing that Ottawa has going for them is they play very fast physical hockey. So they can get on top of the defensemen, wear them down a bit. You saw that in the comeback game they they won in double overtime. I mean they were all over their defensemen in that game. And I I think if you're gonna play against a team like you know, Pittsburgh or Washington in the Eastern Conference Finals, if they get there, I mean, you're going to have to really bring your A game on the defensive side because both of those teams have a very solid defensive core that just doesn't really bend much. No, that's 100% true. And, you know, what you see from – what you saw from New York last night was was a uh, a clinic on hockey overall. I mean, they you saw physical play, you saw good defensive play, and you saw great offensive play. I mean, Zibanejad literally skated through four grown men as if they weren't there. Ultimately, he didn't score. It was a scoring chance at the end of the period, and it led to another scoring chance for Ottawa with five seconds left. But, you know, you see them treating Ottawa's defense like pylons, and that's not, what you t- that's not usually what's to be expected of Ottawa's defense. So, uh, Well, they have... Dion for not the biggest pylon in the game. So yeah, I mean he's he's a viable defenseman. I would take him honestly. Um, and don't ever speak of Brandon Smith in a positive light again. Anyways, don't don't. I hear enough of it on NBC. I hate it. <laughs> it makes me so mad. Anyways, let's let's jump into the other series that no one's really watching too much. The Edmonton Anaheim series. People are watching it, but it's. It's not as exciting as the last two series we have to talk about in the sense that Edmonton, yes, they lost the last game, but they, they seem to have a fairly firm grip on this series. Like It seems to be theirs to lose in my mind. Uh, Anaheim, you know, they may just be, uh, you know, 
feeling them out, but we're going into game four now, and if you were feeling them out for a game or two, you let it go for too long because they win one, they, you know, Edmonton wins one more, you're on the brink of elimination. Like, that's, that's the way it goes. And Anaheim's the kind of team that, you know, at least in past experiences and considering their team is mostly comprised of the same players, they're the kind of team that will let themselves get eliminated. Not that they don't have the capacity to keep up with Edmonton or whomever they've faced, as evidenced by Calgary getting, you know, swept in the first round. But it's more in along the fact along the lines of like, you know, they kind of just I don't know. I, I feel like they they know their fans are coming no matter what. They know that they're viewed as a contender in the West every year. So it's like they kind of just go like, yeah, whatever. You know what I mean? It, 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 that's the effort it looks like to me. Like I, I know I'm summing it up into such very broad strokes, and I'm not doing that intentionally, but that's that's the way it looks to me. Edmonton, Edmonton is just like, fuck yeah, we're happy to be in the playoffs. Let's fucking do this. Like they're like, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna win. We're gonna play. We're gonna blah blah blah. And Anaheim's like, yeah, whatever. And, and Anaheim feels to me like it's like if you work in retail, and this is like their fifth Black Friday. You know what I mean? And Edmonton's on their first Black Friday. And they're like, holy shit, there's customers everywhere. I can make sales everywhere. I'm a commission-based pay. I want a commission-based pay. I'm going to make so much money. And Anaheim's like, the sales will come to you. Calm down. Go have a shot of whiskey. You're fine. You know what I mean? Yeah, I kind of agree. And that's the one thing. If you, whenever we look at playoffs, right, every year, Anaheim places relatively well in their division. They're generally a higher seed. And you never expect them to get out of the first two rounds because they just don't most of the time. Like, they just don't ever capitalize when they need to. And I think the biggest hurdle for them is the series right now because Edmonton has played out of their freaking minds. I think they've played excellent. I think they've had some moments where they haven't played very well and they played on discipline, but they're still a young team. Yada, yada, yada. Cliche, cliche, cliche. But... (laughs) <laughs> you got it. You, you just honestly like watching the, the minutes of this game. You just sit here and it's like Anaheim just like it's like they're waiting for something to magically happen. They're just kind of sitting back, just playing their game. But it's like they're getting outcompeted. They're losing puck battles. Connor McDavid is running right through them. Like he the, the one game, like he literally took over a game. The game two, he took it over completely. And they're just kind of like, we've been here before. It'll be fine, you know. Randy Carla is like. We'll just keep rolling four lines. They lost Patrick Eves. He's out tonight, too, so that could play big into the lines. So, I mean, I, I just don't see this going well for Anaheim, which when Anaheim beat Calgary in the fashion that they did, they played really well. They played dominant in some aspects. I'm just like, okay, Anaheim's for real. They're a good team. And then the first two games of the series, I'm just kind of like, what? This is the same team? Same, same, this is the same people? Are you sure? Because it doesn't look like it. No, and that's the it just thing. It doesn't look like it. That's the thing. Like, if you look at a team like Anaheim, just on a you know, on a team hey, break- on paper, like they yeah, look like, incredible on a, on a breakdown level. You look at them and you're like, oh, um, well, they have the three forwards that you want. You know, you got your Kessler, your Perry, your Getzlov. They got the two f- defensemen that you want with your your Fowler and your Lindholm, and they got the goalie you want with Gibson. Like, they have all the pieces are represented all the way around, and they have. You know, guys like Raquel hanging around in the second and third line who can drop 25 a year, and you're like, okay, it seems like they got all the pieces. But then they get to the postseason, they're just like, eh, we're okay. I don't really feel like putting in a lot of effort on this one. Like, I'm just going to – we're good, man. We're in Anaheim. I mean, it's beautiful. I'll go outside. It's beautiful, baby. Like, they don't – it just doesn't feel to me like they – they want take it. it serious. Yeah, it doesn't. Well, it doesn't feel like they want it. Like they they got their cup in what was it? Oh seven was when they won, I believe. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're they're good. You know what I mean? It just doesn't feel to me. It doesn't. It doesn't feel like they they have the desire to win. You know what I mean? Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe they do. I'm sure that they're all you know trying their best. They're professional athletes, but it feels to me like that top tier talent, the guys who are supposed to break through and put that puck in, it's just the effort's not there. At least I think Ryan me. Getzloff has been playing well, but Corey Perry's kind of been absent-minded in this series, aside from just being a thorn in McDavid's side like Kessler has when he's been out there. But, yeah, you're kind of right. Two out of the three of the main guys that you were thinking of haven't really done much this series. So no, no, Perry and Getzloff never really do in the postseason. I'm sure their numbers are fine, but it never really feels to me like they're regular season Perry and Getzloff. Um, let's jump over into the... Uh, Nashville St. Louis series, which is all but over. I mean, Nashville, Nashville is playing out of their minds this postseason. They're sitting on a seven and one record through eight games. I mean, 
what the fuck? Like, <laughs> what, what are they? Like, I, plain and simple, yeah, that they have, the thing is, you know, the thing about Nashville, you look at a team like Nashville and you're like, okay, well, what you want out of a postseason team, like I, I like what I said about what, what you want out of a team with Anaheim, what you want out of a postseason team is what they actually have, which is that one line that annoys the fuck out of everybody, which is Arvids and Johansson and Forsberg. They have the defenseman that can score from the point and play shot down defense with Subban, and they have the goaltender with a chip on his shoulder trying to prove his name in Pekka Rene. I mean, plain and simple, that's that that that's the makeup of a winner right there. That's the makeup of a champion. Like that's the makeup of a team that could surprise us and give us our first Western Conference champion, not named Chicago or L.A. in this decade. I mean, wow. I'm kind of like on board with the two, you know, I'm not really the biggest Nashville guy, but like watching their hockey, I'm just super impressed just with how they play. And Ryan Ellis, man, that dude is money back there. He's just outstanding. And, you know, Pekka Rene is Pekka Rene. You alluded to it. We've talked about it. He's just, but that team is playing out of their mind and they're playing such energetic hockey that it's like hard not to want to watch it. And then St. Louis is just literally choking so hard. But that's what St. Louis does. Not really surprised there. I was going to say they I mean, do it every year. I mean, and that's the thing, too. It's just like you watch them. It's like they're trying their damnedest to win. And they were in some of these games. But Nashville just has that extra gear. They have that that motivation and want. They they want the win. And you could tell by the way they're playing. And I'm just kind of about it, man. Like on, at first, I was kind of like they beat, they beat Chicago. I was kind of like, ah, Chicago didn't show up. They got lucky. You know, they played well. But, you know, okay, we'll see how they really play now. They're playing St. Louis. And now they're just putting St. Louis in the dirt. And I'm just kind of like, I'm having that, like, come to Jesus moment where just like, <laughs> okay, this team is actually really good. Like, yeah. why did I sleep on this team? This team is excellent. Like, if they get to the Western Conference Finals, say it's them in Edmonton, like, oof. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's, that is not a Western Conference we predicted in any kind of fashion. That is a high-octane uh, super fan involvement series right there is what that is. You have yeah. two fan bases who are yearning for a Stanley Cup run, you know, and man, that, that would be, you'd love to see it. And honestly, you'd hope that their uh, fervor for their teams would lead to viewership numbers and maybe we can start becoming relevant again as a sport, but probably not. Who knows? Uh, I'm, I'm personally pulling for Nashville. I picked them last week. Uh, I see a lot in this team that, you know, they're kind of the everyman team in the sense that they don't have a lot of superstars. You know, they don't have a 100-point guy. They don't have a McDavid. And then, you know, the opposite side of that coin is, of course, Edmonton, which is the uh, the young upstart, you know, f- you know, phenom-based team that more or less lives and dies by a McDavid and Talbot. And it, I think it would make for an interesting Western Conference final. Speaking of what is basically the final of their conference, last series we need to talk about, Washington and Pittsburgh, I mean, this is the series that we wanted. I mean, cut and dry. I mean, it is, uh, with the exceptions of Game 2, I know Game 2 was a little bit of a blowout. I believe the final was, what, 6-3 to three or something to that effect? 6-3, mm-hmm. to yeah. It, it, with the exception of Game 2, and even most of Game 2 was not that, these have been knock down, drag them out, fight for every single square fucking inch of ice that you can possibly get. High-octane, love-to-watch playoff hockey games. I mean, they are... <clears throat> Everything you want in a postseason, I said this last week, and I stand by it 100%. If you have never, if you are listening to this because you're a family member of Steve's, a family member of mine, or a friend of Steve's or mine, and say you're like, well, I, I'm just listening because these guys put their work in, watch this fucking series. Like, go spend time with this series. It's on, it's on NBC Sports. You have it if you have cable. You have it if you have PlayStation View. You have it if you have any form of, you know, live streaming cable. Even Hulu's new beta fucking has it. Go watch this series. Go to a bar if you don't have TV and watch this series. This is amazing hockey played by two nearly perfect teams who are both primed for a cup run. And yes, Crosby did get injured, so that may lead to you know, less substantial play or less, you know, crazy play like we have seen. But what I think it, what I think the ultimate, you know, winner of this series, I think is going to be your cup winner. I just think that what Washington is capable of doing and what Pittsburgh is, is just unbelievable. Like I I watch every second of it that I possibly can. I'll go, I'm going to go over my data limits this month on both of my mobile phone plans because I'm so busy watching this series. (laughs) I mean, I can't turn it off. It's so great. I mean, you got, you know, everybody playing their roles. You got, you know, you have your storylines with, uh, 
you know, Crosby coming out and Pittsburgh now having to step up. Not like they don't have a superstar to step in with Evgeny Malkin and Phil Castle right Everybody behind him. Everybody forgets Malkin. Like, he oh, doesn't they definitely exist. Do. That irritates me. They 100% do. But, you know, you have a superstar waiting to step up and have his time, and God help you, I hope he does. I mean, this is this is the kind of series you want out of almost any postseason series, plain and simple. At least that's what I've seen. Sorry to Bogart the mic. You should probably talk a little bit. No, you're good. I, I love it when you bring it like that, man. Just get me all hot and sweaty over here. But um, I just I, I think that for the NHL, this is optimal for viewing. Like this is what they want the fans to see. This is this is like you you tell somebody who's never watched a hockey game to watch this. 100 percent correct with that. It's just like yeah, even without Crosby there, you still have Malkin. You still have, you know, Kessel. You know, you have Haglin back like there's still plenty of talent to go around without Crosby and not to mention this next game is probably going to be one of the best games of the series I just have a feeling tonight is going to be a very good game because you have all these storylines like you alluded to Penguins are going to come out probably playing pissed off hockey they're on the road I mean I think they're going to bring it I think they're going to this is going to be the telltale game if Pittsburgh wins this game series is over it's done I don't care what it says Pittsburgh wins tonight and we, we can't forget that when teams go up 2-0, and the rate in which they win a seven-game series is almost 84%. It's it's pretty astronomical to have to come back down from that. So, I mean, if anybody could do it, it's the Capitals, which I think the Capitals have played really well in most regards. I think game one, the first 10 or 15 minutes, they were kind of tentative, but they've come back and they've played really well considering. And the one thing that I still hear people say is, you know, where's Ovechkin? I don't know scoring all the goals on the power play. Like, He's doing what he's supposed to do. Like he's where, never been a guy that's not shown up in the postseason. And, and I heard this. I was listening to ninety seven one the other day, right? And this irritated the shit out of me. Well, that's and where you I, went I, wrong. It it probably shouldn't. But you know they're sitting there. I forgot who it was, but they were sitting there talking. It was Pat Caputo. Go figure. He's like, yeah, Ovechkin doesn't show up in the playoffs. I just wanted to be like head snap. Like what? The Pat guy's Caputo, a point per game plus player. Pat Caputo is the Mike Milbury of ninety seven one. You're right. Like he's a buffoon. It, it it boggles my mind that that man has a Cy Young vote. Like he doesn't <laughs> seem to know shit about shit. Like I'm not gonna sit. Like I, I I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like the part of the fact that you know we're somewhat of a rival network to them isn't part of my motivations for their my despisal of him specifically. But my God, man, like he just doesn't know anything. And and to say that Ovechkin disappears in the postseason really really i mean it, it what better way to make it obvious that he doesn't know hockey uh, it, ovechkin is everywhere in this this series this is why i'm saying you need to watch it this is this is like that uh that that dude on twitter uh uh last year the like the black guy who never watched hockey oh, tone lock or whatever it, it, it wasn't tone look was it it was it was it was like tone something i don't know <laughs> tony something i don't know but he was like yo this game is lit like that's that that will be your reaction to any game in this series. Like you, the, we don't have much time left with this series. I think we have maybe five more days. You know, again, dear listener, spend time with this series. If you're out because you're like, oh, I'm a Wings fan, or I'm a Canucks fan, or I I, I only like Boston. I don't care what you are. Go spend time with this series. Even if you hate both of these teams, I fucking hate Washington. They take all the best players, and Pittsburgh has all these great players. And Pittsburgh wins every year. I'm sick of it. I don't give a fuck what your thoughts are. Go watch the series because you're wrong. It's great hockey. It's phenomenal hockey. It's 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 it, you can't miss it. You you should not it's, miss it. It sucks that the best matchup of the whole entire playoffs could be the second round <laughs> in the Eastern Conference. Like after this, it's kind of like the Stanley Cup Finals could be exciting if Nashville gets it or if Edmonton wins. Like the storylines are going to be there, but this is the creme de la crop of talent right here. Second round. Yeah. Playoffs. No, that- the the rest of the matchups will be good based on stories. This is ba- good based on pure talent, and this is where you want to be. Like plain and simple, this is this is where you want to spend your time. This is what you want to do with your life if you have the time to spend on it. I mean, it's there's just cut and dry. There's not better hockey to watch in this postseason or in in, in anything. They don't. Nobody plays at this level in the regular season. You just don't see this level of effort. I mean. Wow. I mean, how much more good can I say about this series other than to say just <laughs> fucking watch it? Like, the one, I was going to say, the, the one thing I did want to give just like a little kudos to is TJ Oshie, I think, has played out of his fucking mind 
Like, literally. He's played so incredibly well. He might not show up in the score sheet, but he's doing all of these things that just make that team so good. He's playing on the line with probably the two best players in the world, outside of Crosby. I mean, and he's just doing it. He brings a physical game. He's just like, I've always loved TJ Oshie and just the way he's played hockey. Just, he's out there. He's not afraid to throw the body around. He can score goals, and he could punch you in the face. Like, that's your epitome of, like, hockey fan. You're like, you love that. And I think he's played incredibly well. And the same thing goes for on the other side of it. I think Marc-Andre Fleury has played out of his fucking mind. Like, he's played excellent. And for a guy that's supposedly be goalie number two, like, he could... It'd be insane if they, they get through this and win a Stanley Cup final again on two goalies not expecting to even be starters, continue to lead their team to a Stanley Cup final. That'd be nuts. I agree. No, I, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with you in any way. I mean, that's plain and simple. And I want to wrap the show up. I want to finish uh, a little portion of the conversation we had last week. Uh, it was brought to my attention by a listener. We didn't really dive into goaltending equipment at all. And, and this is, you know, it, this is not going to be an ongoing saga, but I do want to finish the conversation because we kind of ran out of time last week. I don't want to dive into it too much, but I do want to just discuss uh, blockers and trappers and chest protectors because, uh, and, and maybe this is why I want to talk about it because you probably know more about it. The NHL has possible regulations coming down on them in the coming years. Do you know how that will affect things? And then also, you know, part two of that question is with some of the gear, cons- or some of the brand consolidation we saw in sticks, is that going on in goaltending gear as well? Yeah, the, the brand consolidation is definitely happening. There's a lot less like companies producing goalie equipment in general. There's some, you know, companies trying to get more into it. Like Warrior, they've started to release lines over the last few years. I mean, I haven't played net in a while, so I'm kind of out of touch with some of that stuff. But uh, with the goalie, the, the regulations, there's always going to be some kind of changes, and eventually that'll work its way into the recreate or not recreational, just like the lower levels of hockey. Because um, at some points, you know, when they did start cha- adjusting all the equipment, they had to adjust the equipment for the whole line. So it'd be like the next year's line would have all the implementations just in case. So Okay, so any regulations that will affect the NHL will ultimately affect even just the regular adult rec player? More than likely, but it might be one of those things where, like, if they don't have those rules in, like, say, USA Hockey... You'll see two different sets of pads. You'll see like a pro, you'll see like a pro series pad, and then just like the regular pad because like the pro series will have all the professional adjustments needed to play within the regulations. Okay, and that's I, actually I, really common in a lot of different sports. You have like the pro gear, and then like still the same like quality gear, just not with the set regulations. Okay, I was just curious about that. And just real quick to touch on it, what are what are some of the you know we'll just sum it down. What is the best brand for blockers and best brand, best brand the best brand for trappers, if you will. I think a lot of it comes down to fit and break in for that stuff. And I mean, you can't really go wrong with CCM because a lot of it is just because of they inherited Reebok technology. And I think Reebok was one of the best at putting out a lot of their pads, like the flex pads. And they've always been, you know, the, the forefront because, you know, Reebok also bought Coho back in the day. So it's like subsidiaries of certain brands condensed under one name. So they have some of the best technology in the game. And, I've always just loved the durability of their pads is pretty much a big thing for me. And they've always lasted the longest for me. So, okay. Just making sure we're just finishing up the conversation. That's yeah, that's, that's definitely an important piece. We don't want to forget the goalies out there. No, we don't. Cause the goalies, I mean, you know why we don't want to forget the goalies out there. And the reason I wanted to touch on it is because, you know, as we come to the end of our conversation, when you look at the postseason, the defining trait of most of these games has been the goaltender. They are the forgotten heroes of the, of, of hockey. I mean, a lot of scrutiny is placed on them, but also they are also it's weird. They're uh, both in the spotlight and also in the shadows. It's 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 a mm-hmm. weird dichotomy of being a goalie. And I'm sure you've experienced that both being, you know, a goalie in organized hockey and then also in rec. Uh, but, you know, and before I get into my diatribe, this is going to be a new part of this at the end of every week. I need our listeners like, you know, Steve, you've heard from Roger. We've heard from Roger on this. Dear our listeners, like we need our reviews. We don't need our reviews to, uh, we don't need it to you know to make our egos feel any better. We don't need it to up our you know oh we're performing good or whatever. We don't need the ego boost. We need this because we want our reviews. Your review of us. You're hopefully five star. We put a lot of effort in. We hope we put on a good show for you. Uh, review of us pushes our show up without us having to you know try to compete with the nerdist or with ESPN. We can't, we're never going like plain and simple. 
we're not a fucking uh, monolith of media. Like we we're just we're guys who all love our sports that we talk about, and we all love to talk to you as listeners. But we need your help in give us a review. Get us so that other ears can hear us, so that other eyes can see us. If you like what we do, you'll like to help us out because, you know, at a certain point, uh, this becomes, I mean, just to, to not put it in such grim terms, but at a certain point, it becomes a bad investment where we're not getting any return on investment in terms of we're not spreading the word beyond a certain point. We've reached our ceiling right now. We, you know, it, it is through your efforts as listeners uh, spreading the word on us that we've reached an absolute ceiling in a very short time. I mean, we're talking four or five years, which is really short for any group of people just talking sports to get to. But to cross that line, to get to the next level, to get to, you know, having everybody pay attention to us, having everybody listen to us, having not everybody, but more people listen to us. I mean, it to to, to expand us even further to get better things for all of our shows we need the reviews to expand further so i'm I'm begging you you know you already subscribe to us you already know where to find us i need you to 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 give us a review on itunes give us a review on podbean specifically itunes though because a lot of people use a lot of people use iphones and that way when you search us we'll come up quicker we'll come up a lot quicker if you get those five star reviews so uh, now for my usual uh, post amble, subscribe to us on iTunes. If you're not into iTunes, check us out on TuneIn Radio. We're also on Podbean, Stitcher, Facebook, Google Play. Uh, you can follow the brand on Twitter at Sports Radio DET. You can follow our sister show uh, once it comes back from hiatus at STW underscore SRD. You can follow me on Twitter at JM Pinkham. You can follow Steve on Twitter at Franchise GFX. Check out our website at sportsradiodetroit.com. Thank you, and we'll see you guys next week.